life's many mysteries and the fascination of our next guest for more than 50 years. Has there ever been, is there, life on Mars? Uh, a new documentary by Professor Brian Cox sees him fulfil a childhood dream going behind the scenes at NASA Mission Control for Mars 2020, one of the most ambitious missions ever launched. But did he find life on the red planet? Is there anything? Well, Brian joins us now. I, I, we, it's lovely to have you in the studio. We've all been very excited that you're here and bombarding you with questions, uh, not least for our families. But for you, and it's lovely to, have to, to be able to do that, to go behind the scenes and, and explore what you've just been exploring at NASA, what was that like? It's wonderful, because the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, that's where they built all the iconic spacecraft that I grew up with from the 60s, 70s, 80s. So people remember Voyager, the first mission out Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, uh, the Viking landers that landed on Mars, they were all built there. And so to get that, I wrote to them, actually. It's in the documentary in the 19, late 1970s, I think. It, How old were you? Little kid in Oldham, about 10 years old. And I wrote to them and said, you know, it's NASA, this romantic thing. And they wrote back and sent pictures back. And it's one of the reasons that I, you know, continued and carried on into science. It's just that little bit of a personal touch. Nice. So I said to them, I remember the address. And it is, it's Jet Push Laboratory, 9,800 Oak Grove Drive, Pasadena, California. <laughs> I, I've had it in my head since That's the so age cool. of 10. That's fantastic, and they've encouraged this lifelong interest. So, is there life on Mars? We don't know. There's a rover as we speak, um, Perseverance rover. It's now on an ancient river delta. It's an astonishing thing to say. On Mars, it's a dry river delta, and it's drilling down now, and it's taking samples, and they're going to be returned to Earth for analysis. So the answer is we don't know, but it is possible, which is why we have a rover there looking for it. How long will it take to get those samples back? Oh, it's, uh, it's mid-2030s. Okay. It's an astonishingly yeah. complicated yeah. mission to get them back. How does that... I mean, what happens with that mission, then? Oh, it's astonishing. It's, <laughs> well, they, they have to launch two more missions. So they launch another one, which um, puts another lander down, which goes and collects the samples and puts them in a little rocket. They didn't know how to launch the rocket. It's hard from the surface of Mars. So they're going to catapult the rocket into the air using, they tell me, car airbags, basically. So they explode them, fling it into the air, light the engine, send it into orbit. Yeah. It's a little ball about that big, a beach ball-sized thing with the samples in. And then they're going to look for it in orbit, send another mission to get it, and then fire the rockets on that and send it back to Earth. It enters the atmosphere ballistically, which is with no parachutes or rockets, and impacts somewhere in Utah and then they're going to go and find it. Oh and that's the simplest way that's anybody's thought of of getting that's, the samples back. That's like when I'm trying to find my son it's and I look at my find my on my phone, like, <laughs> where on earth is he? It's going to be... A, the idea it's, that it's incredible. But this is billions of dollars of research funding to... And that's, the, that's how they've got to do it to get it back. It's the, the, the simplest and most reliable yeah. way. It just shows you how difficult it is yeah. to get things from Mars to the Earth. In, in terms of distance, how far away, how long does it take that journey? From, you, to and from Mars? It's, it's months if you get, several months, if you get Mars in the right place. So it's every couple of years Mars and the Earth are in the right place that you can do a short journey. So then you have to wait two years because they kind of go around the sun different speeds and then they line up again and you can send a mission there. So that's life on Mars dealt with. <laughs> um, let's talk about UFOs. Um, there has been the first public congressional hearing into UFOs in the United States, where two top military officials said there's usually an explanation for UFOs, but in some cases, they still could not identify what these objects were. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, the, the answer is that they're unidentified, yeah, <laughs> so we don't know what they are. I mean, it's, but is um, there alien life out well, there? It's one of the great questions. Um, are there... And, and we mean civilizations now. Yes. If we find life on Mars, it'll be microbes. And it's a tremendously important question, I think. Where, how far would you have to go? I'm sure there must be other civilizations somewhere in the universe. There are, there are two... Well, there are, there are 400 billion suns in our galaxy and there are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. So clearly, there has to be somewhere. The question is, how far? And actually, when I speak to biologists, it's interesting. If you look at the history of life on Earth, there's an unbroken chain of life. We're all related to every living thing on the planet. The origin of life is nearly four billion years ago on this planet. But it took most of that time 
so for the civilization on the planet, four billion years, a third of the age of the universe. And so it's possible to argue that there may be very few civilizations out there in a typical galaxy. Mm -hmm. And I say, often, I, I'd say a good working assumption is there's one, which, which is us. And that's, a, that's actually a very powerful and important idea. Um, look, you're on a tour, aren't you? Uh, Horizons, a 21st century space odyssey. It's already kicked off. You've already done a huge chunk of it. You're yeah. coming to the Royal Opera House in London. You're going to um, other cities as well and then ending in, in Glasgow. And you've got this uh, documentary out as well. You're able to answer the, t answer the toughest questions. Um, in a live interview. You've already answered about life on Mars, about UFOs. So the other big question this morning, how long can Boris Johnson <laughs> stay in number 10 Downing Street with the ministers toppling around him? I mean, I mean, I could answer you sort of facetiously in astronomical terms, not very long relative <laughs> to the age of the universe, <laughs> but I think not very long relative to, well, a, what, a day, maybe, I, I imagine. His I mean, it's a... You know, another, another minister's gone, the pensions minister, Guy Popperman, has uh, also resigned uh, recently. So they are, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a moving landscape, as they Yeah, think. and it, it is. I mean, the serious point is it's a, it's a big problem for many industries, but it's a problem in science. I mean, we have a lack of trust, I think, with a, particularly with Europe. And, and whatever you think of, of Brexit, science is a collaborative mm. enterprise. You know, I work myself at CERN, which is a huge collaboration. Um, so, and we're having problems with trust really. And so there's, there's a particular funding scheme called Horizon, which is the biggest international funding scheme. We, we've just lost over 100 million in grants. Uh, not, not specifically because we left the no. EU or anything like that. It really is diplomatic relations that are causing the problem. So it is, it's a serious problem for us. Professor Brian Cox, it's good to see you this morning.